Hello, art history students. Welcome to today's lecture on the art of South America. So you might be wondering, why are we talking about this now? We just got done talking about the Renaissance. And one of the last images that I left you with, or that we sh talked about in the Northern Renaissance, was Elizabeth's Armada portrait. And we talked about how she has her hand over that globe and sort of this, the world is sort of expanding and growing at this time frame. So it sort of makes sense that we're gonna take a step away from the area of Europe and sort of that, we've kind of been centrally talking about the Mediterranean and the area around the Mediterranean up into this point. So we're really branching out for this next unit and talking about all the artwork that we haven't seen from other areas of the world. Okay, so like I said, um, we're talking about South America today, specifically the western coast of South America and the areas around the Andes Mountains. This is a very arid and dry area. Um, it's a very mountainous area, like I said before. So um, remember, I want you to keep in mind that these are past cultures that don't, we don't have very strong records of their belief systems and structures. So there are a lot of things as far as like the current indigenous cultures can tell us about the past cultures. And then we're looking at them through the lens of their artwork, through European accounts. And I just want you to keep in mind that European accounts and all archeologists are always gonna be slightly influenced by the beliefs of their own culture. Um, it's very difficult to filter those things out. It's just something that we should be aware of as we move forward. Okay, so again, we're talking about that western coast of South America. We're going to be talking about these are the major cultures that we're going to include, the Chavin and the Parcarnas. We're going to talk about those. Those are kind of the earliest cultures. We're going to talk about them together. Then the Nazca, Moche, and Inca. So all, the, all these cultures and all this artwork that we're going to see is going to share a couple of major themes, but it is important to be aware that it's taking place over a very long period of time. Okay, so the first cultures that we're going to talk about are the Chavin and the Paracas. These are the oldest cultures in the area of Peru. Their temples and stone monuments will become later pilgrimage centers. A lot of their art features um, the animals and the cosmos and also sort of human animal hybrids. So sort of that idea, that vocabulary word of zoomorphic that we learned about um, in past lectures. So they also created spectacular textiles and this is something that we're going to see all the way through all of the cultures that we're going to talk about today um, this is a very arid and dry environment but it's also a very cold environment so let's get right into the first one this is the first artwork that we're going to look at by the chavin this is the romandi stella this is not the first Stella that we've looked at, so this would have been something that the community would have seen, right? Sort of a standing stone that communicates something to a, a variety of people. That's sort of what a Stella is. And I know it's very difficult to see. Take a moment and then we're going to look at it. its line work broken down for us. This is the line work from the Romandi Stella. So I want you to take a moment and just kind of digest what you see here. This is kind of a close-up image of it. So what exactly do you think you're looking at here? And then we'll break the image down. So here we can see the image both upside down and right side up. So this image has something called contour rivalry. It describes more than one object at the same time. So if we look here, we can kind of see a man's face and he appears to be holding sort of two stalks of what we would assume would be maize or corn. And then he has this very elaborate headdress up here. And then if we look at the other image in reverse, we can sort of see this crocodile mouth here. And then these hands of this man sort of become more like crocodile fins or feet and all of these sort of swirls that we kind of took 
to mean um, like stalks of corn now sort of look like waves or water. And we see these this crocodile, this headdress suddenly becomes a series of crocodiles that are all sort of eating and biting at each other. So there's like this double image in within this one image. And remember, that's called contour rivalry. That might be a vocabulary word that shows up on the test. All right, next we're going to talk about the Paracas textiles. Remember I said that they're very well preserved due to the dry conditions surrounding the Andes Mountains. So these are mantles. They're um, garments for burial purposes, right? So it says that it has an elaborate mythological figure on it. But there's a couple things that we can see as we break this image down. So we see this use of overlapping as each of these little um, sort of snake characters or sort of eel-like creatures, they wrap around and go over top of each other. We also see that same thing where they're sort of biting and interacting with each other, right? We see this sort of, um, this similar to the sort of twisted perspective that we, there's that vocabulary word that we've used before in this class. So there's a little bit of that use of twisted perspective. All right, so these are mythological figures that are associated with, with death and with the afterlife. Because again, this is a garment that's used for burial purposes. Okay, so here is another example. This is a border fragment, likely from one of those mantles used for uh, burial purposes. So both the Chavin and the Paracas culture's imagery is going to be full of iconography. So that's vocabulary word that we've heard quite a few times in this class. Um, if you need a refresher, remember Mary is always in blue and that's part of her iconographical identity. So we don't know exactly all of the stories that go along with this culture but we can tell that they're using iconography. If you look at all the characters in this little um, border fragment that we have here, some of them have, they have different objects, they have different colors associated with them. This person has the same sort of headdress and color scheme as this person over here. So we can assume that they are the same person and that these are different people, right? So it's that use of the imagery and the use of the symbols within the imagery to tell a story that you would already know. The Romandi Stella probably has iconography that goes along with it, right? There's probably some sort of story about all those crocodile mouths and that headdress and that individual. We don't necessarily know what that story is, but we can tell that there's definitely iconography happening in this culture's imagery. Next culture that we're gonna talk about is the Nazca. So the Nazca are most famous for their line drawings like these. So if you're unfamiliar with the Nazca or have never seen these line drawings before, I'm going to give you just a moment to think about, think about where you think this, uh, this image is. How big you think it is, how small you think it is, um, is it vertical, is it horizontal, those kinds of things. So just take a moment and kind of think about what this might be. These images are actually geoglyphs. They're large designs on the ground and they're very, very large. So they're formed by creating a, a sort of like digging a shallow ditch. So the top layer of rocks in the Nazcan Desert is a reddish brown color. And underneath of that are these um, white pebbles. So by moving just that top layer of rocks, there's actually an image that's left behind. It's sort of like a negative line image. So these are very, very large. They kind of can't be seen all at once. And the ancient alien people love to talk about that, that they're sort of like best seen from this overhead point of view. Now, I'm not... Uh, prescribing to the ancient alien theory, but I think you should all watch the TV show because it is funny, right? We have lots of time to watch TV now. It might be um, 
something just to add to your bucket list of TV that you all are watching at this moment. So this is the spider. This is another one of those large uh, Nazkin images in the ground, right? You can also see there are, it's almost like there's a procession kind of line. That's how archaeologists think that these were actually used, was they were used for sort of procession. So people would walk and move sort of within the confines of this um, object shape or move around it. And that might be how the trench was actually sort of dug or maintained. Again, these are both just theories. This is one of my favorite ones. This is the hummingbird. So again, it really goes to show how arid this climate is, that these were created all the way back, um, potentially as far back as 100 BC, and they're still sort of seen today in the same, um, potentially the same clarity that they would have been seen at the time that they were created. So this is a very arid uh, desert. Again, there's sort of that procession line, right, that we can kind of see that's the, the going theory on how these objects were used in this ritual purpose. Okay, so here we see some Nazca bird ornaments. These would have adorned textiles. So we've talked a little bit about um, the textiles of these cultures around the Andes Mountains. So these would have been sort of like little pendants that you would have worn. They would, they're made of gold, so they would have been an indicator of the wearer's social status, right? Birds are very important to the Nazca. We see them over and over again in their art in different fashions. So, like I said, we see a lot of bird motifs in Naskin artwork in a variety of forms, both those geoglyphs and those um, small sort of pendant, uh, metal pendants that would have adorned textiles. And then also with this double spouted bottle, the ceramic bottle would have likely been used to maybe hold wine of some kind or even just drinking water. But it has these hummingbird motifs on it or motif on it that are sort of going around the shape of the bottle. And this isn't 100% art history related, but I don't know if you guys know that hummingbirds actually migrate. They migrate very, very far. So the ink or the uh, Nazkin people would have been seeing these hummingbirds that would have migrated here. But the hummingbirds that we actually see in this area migrate all the way down into, all the way from Canada down into Mexico, which I think is very fascinating. I know it's not super art history related, but it's fascinating. Okay, so the next culture that we're going to talk about is the Moche. These are from northern Peru, and they're mainly known for their pottery and textiles, mostly for their pottery, which is what we're going to focus our attention on. So first is the moche ear spool. It's sort of like those um, gauges for your ears, those large ear pieces. Um, it would have been worn through the ear lobe. Um, this was found in a royal tomb. So gold if to the moche was very valuable for its symbolic association with the sun and the sun's energy. So we've talked about other cultures that have had this same um, association with gold and the sun and sort of this worship of the celestial body, the sun. What culture was that? You're right, the ancient Egyptian culture. So we see a couple other things that are similar to the ancient Egyptian culture here. One is hierarchical scale. If you don't remember that vocabulary word, this gentleman in the center is both the largest figure and the most important figure. He's more important than the two smaller figures behind him. So again, this ear spool would have been worn only by sort of someone from a royal family. It's very much a indicator of social status and uh, high status. It would be very large and sort of flashy. Okay, the next thing that we're going to talk about is the moche ceramics and specifically these bottles that they create with usually um, 
figures on them. Usually people are on these. So this is a skeletal couple with a child, right? It sort of has this sort of like tender sort of family moment. These two figures are sort of holding hands. Another here are, these are multiple bottles. You can kind of see some in the background. So there were many, many of these made. And these are stirrup bottles depicting childbirth. So you can actually see the act of childbirth happening and being represented in this ceramic bottle, which is strange because ceramic is a static object and the act of childbirth is very much so an action that happens. But these bottles are actually representing the natural cycle of life. Having said that, there are a lot of these stirrup bottles which depict sexual acts. So I don't have a whole lot of examples of that in this PowerPoint. We're trying to kind of keep this class at sort of a PG level. They're very graphic, some of these um, images on these bottles are. But what I want you guys to remember is that they are part of this larger cycle. So the cycle of life and death has to have this this act, this action of um, intercourse has to happen within that to create that cycle and create that cycle, which is actually sort of a religious cycle. Unfortunately, when Spanish missionaries came through during that time and found all of these bottles that had these sexual acts depicted on them, they didn't quite understand what they were representing and what they were for. They saw them as heathenistic and, and smutness and destroyed a lot of these. They were very, very common. This was not, um, the, the European, uh, the Christian European eyes that saw these was a very different lens, like we talked about that lens that you look at other cultures through, it was a very different lens than the Moche had seen these and how they um, viewed that this act as part of sort of life. So it is something to keep it note that these were sort of destroyed, not quite in the same way that an iconoclasm happened, but this is a little bit different. These religious, pseudo-religious objects were destroyed by an outside religion. So something to keep in mind. Okay, last but not least, we're going to talk about the Inca. So this is probably the largest um, empire that uh, was in South America for a very long time. Sometimes this is spelled Inca with a K and sometimes with a C. Um, I, you may see it spelled both ways in this PowerPoint. I try to go with whatever the source was. So if I got the source image from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I use whatever spelling they used. But I think the new spelling is with the K and I think it becomes a little bit more that's sort of like an indigenous spelling, so a little bit more of a correct spelling. All right, so this being the largest uh, culture that would have developed in South America around the Andes, they was a powerful ruler called Pachacute and Pachacute built a large private estate called Machu Picchu. So Machu Picchu was on top of a mountain. Again, these are the uh, Andes Mountains. And this the condor is depicted throughout this place, throughout Machu Picchu, because that was the uh, association, that was sort of um, Pachacute's iconographical identifier was the condor. So that was sort of like his image that represented himself. So the architecture of this place is mortarless stonework. Um, it has a terrace structure, which is built high in the mountains. So it has a plumbing system. And I put that sort of like in quotations. It's basically a way that directs water through and away from all of the architecture that you see there. And it still works to this day. It was so well planned that water is still draining into and away from all of this terraced um, architecture that we see here. It's very, very impressive. And one of the key, if the Roman architectural innovation that they are most associated with is the arch, I would say that it's this terraced structures that are built are very closely associated with the Inca. 
they're not the only ones that did it. They're not the first ones that did it, but it's very closely associated with them in the same way that the arch is very closely associated with Rome or the Romans. So I wanted to show you guys some examples of these farming terraces in Peru and kind of talk exactly about how the Inca use these terraces and what they use them for. So this is a very, like I said, an, an arid, dry climate and it's very mountainous. So these terraces allow you to farm up a steep incline and they also sort of conserve and preserve water as um, if rain is limited when the rain falls on the top um, terrace, whatever sort of it can't use or can't be absorbed by that soil is draining down into the next level. So they really brought, um, they're, you're able to grow a lot more uh, food from these terraces. So having said that, the Incan sort of as a, a large culture or as a conquering culture used these terraces as part of their conquering technique. It's very different than anything else we would have seen in the world. So if you were sort of a culture or a group that the Inca wanted to absorb into their empire, they didn't necessarily just go in with, um, you know, sort of guns blazing, take over the place. They sort of went in and talked to you about what you needed. Did you need more terraces for farming? Did you need more storage for your grain? What were sort of your, um, things that were important to you. And then sort of an agreement was made where you would become part of the Incan Empire and then the Incan Empire would build you more terraces, build you more storage, and then any extra food or grain that you would grow would go back to the army. So their army was sort of like, it was an army, it was a force that, you know, it was a military force, but it was also like an army corps of engineers that, um, developed the culture and that was how they were able to take on and become the largest uh, force in South America or the largest sort of unified culture. So on that note, there's something that is just as if not more important than anything else to the Incan Empire and that is wool. It's kind of odd. So this um, silver llama figure wears a red blanket um, sort of on its back, which is made of cinnamon or cinnabar. So the llamas have critical importance to the Incan Empire. They provide the wool or fiber that's used to create these textiles. And when you have textiles, when you have clothing that... Um, is made of wool. It's an identifier of your social status. And this would have indicated a more, like a higher social status than gold and silver would have, which is mind blowing. Okay. So this is an Incan tunic, which would have been worn by the Incan ruler. And the patterns on it symbolize the conquest of all the possible ethnicities or all the possible villages and smaller communities. So like I said, that that sort of the way in which they would um, conquer and sort of absorb other groups into their empire is being visually depicted in this tunic. So on that note, this is technically a moche bottle. This is technically um, from the previous culture, but I slid it in here because I feel like it goes along with showing off that the value of this wool and the value of um, the value of warmth and clothing. So this is again, it's a very dry and arid environment. It's very cold in these mountains. So here we have a figure who is showing his tunic. He's actually showing it off, and this moment of showing off this tunic, showing off this sweater, is basically immortalized on this ceramic pot, which really, really, the layers of importance of this being depicted here really give you the, the level of importance that they would have held for these objects, for these tunics, for wool and for the fiber. Okay, last but not least, um, 
there is a Disney movie called The Emperor's New Groove, which is basically about the Incans. Um, it has very many similarities between sort of the city of Machu Picchu and then the city that the llama is trying to build. There's a llama in the movie. If you haven't seen it, we're all under sort of lockdown quarantine. I think it would be would be a fun activity. There's not going to be any test questions about it or anything like that, but just a fun activity for you guys just to maybe, if you have or can watch this movie, um, that's your sort of homework until until we have the test. <laughs> so. Here are all of your key terms and ideas. All right, so next time we're going to talk about Mesoamerican art, which is art from um, Central America. All right, so if you don't understand any of these um, key terms, please uh, email me or get in contact with me in some way, and we'll make sure we clarify them for you. Thank you so much. Stay happy and healthy, guys.